my creative critters and welcome to Sketching with Sarah. I'm Sarah and on this channel I share my passion for animals through my other passion art and sometimes I make silly animal hybrids and this is part three of my mixed media drawing of a ring-tailed beamer. If you're curious of the origin story of this creature that I came up with, check out part one but the short of it is I was inspired by M. Byhold's song Numb Little Bug and so naturally my brain said ah a beamer because that's logical right I explained it a little bit more in part one so definitely check it out if you're interested anyway in this part I'm showing you my process adding colored pencil and ink and a little digital magic to finish up this drawing as well as share some cool things you might not know about ring-tailed lemurs as well as bees so enough chit chat, let's get into some interesting things that I learned about ring-tailed lemurs. In part one, I talked about their general info, like where they live and what they eat. And today I'm going to be sharing some more intriguing things that I didn't know about ring-tailed lemurs. Ring-tailed lemurs spend more than a third of their time on the ground, which is more than any other lemur species. And I touched on this a little bit in part one, but because lemurs spend so much time on the ground, most of their diet is all kinds of insects and even bark. Another fun fact that I learned is that ring-tailed lemurs tail is longer than its body. I love their tails and I think the most defining and iconic feature of a ring-tailed lemur is their tail that has all of those rings on it. Side note the tail was by far my favorite part to draw and paint in this illustration. I just loved adding all of the wispy lines to create the hair texture and it was just a lot of fun to play around with. Something else interesting that I found out that's a little weird and a little gross is that male ring-tailed lemurs put smells from the glands in their booties onto their tail and then they wave their tail around at rivals and it's known as stink fighting. I guess putting it on their tail makes the waft of the smell wave around more? I mean, what a bizarre way to flick off your enemies, am I right? I guess they are straight to the point in that sense. <laughs> in part one, I mentioned that a group of ring-tailed lemurs is called a troop, and I also learned that they are known as Maki in Malagasy, which is the language spoken in Madagascar where the ring-tailed lemur is native to. And apparently their Latin name is Kata or Kata because of their cat-like looks. I guess I can kind of see how visually they look a little bit like cats, in the eyes and the ears and how they move their tails when they walk around on all fours. But in my opinion, there are way more differences than similarities between these lemurs and cats. Ring-tailed lemurs are also fascinating in how they adapt when food is scarce. They are actually able to reduce their metabolism to hold on to food longer. And because they're reducing their metabolism, this slows them from starving. They still have a difficult time without food, which is understandable, but I thought it would just so interesting that their bodies can just decide to slow down their metabolism as a survival instinct. So I hope you learned something about ring-tailed lemurs. Now let's talk about bees. Bees are truly amazing creatures, but I want to talk about their sting. In part one, I talked about how there are around 20,000 species of bees and they're all different in many ways. Bumblebees are like wasps in that they can sting you multiple times, but honeybees can only sting you once because because their stinger latches onto your skin and then when they try to fly away it gets ripped out of their abdomen and causes them to die. What an awful way to go but that just shows how dedicated the bees are to their hive if they feel it's threatened or if they feel they're threatened because they help run the hive too. Now let's talk about beehives. We are all familiar with the iconic honeycomb shapes that honeybees create out of wax and they usually build their hives in protected areas like trees or nooks and crannies of buildings building walls. The colonies are usually really large with up to 60 thousand workers. Bees naturally make their hives, but something I didn't know is that today it's way more common for honeybees to live in artificial hive created by a beekeeper than a hive in the wild. When it comes to bumblebees, they also make wax cells for their nests, but they tend to live in cavities on the ground that are already burrowed out by people or other animals, and their colonies are much smaller and can have anywhere from 40 to 400 worker bees. That is quite a bit smaller than the 60,000 workers that honeybees usually have in their colonies. 
Carpenter bees is another very common species of bee, and they get their name because they make their nests by carving out tunnels in wood. Then there are also species of bees that don't even live together in the same colony, and instead they are solitary insects that create a single nest for themselves in dry ground that gets a good amount of sun exposure. These bees are called androidid beads. Although these bees do live alone, they do tend to nest near each other like a little bee neighborhood. Something I never paid attention to is that bees have five eyes and two sets of wings that can fly at about 20 miles per hour. It's a speedy little bug. Something else I didn't know is that male bees are called drones and female bees who are not the queen bee are called worker bees. Speaking of the queen, the queen honey bee stays in the hive and lays about 2,000 eggs per day to create more little worker baby bees. The worker honeybees really do a lot of work. In fact, foragers collect nectar from about 2 million flowers to make one pound of honey. That's a lot of work and a lot of flowers. The honeybees carry pollen on their hind legs in a little pollen basket called a corbicula. Bees have been important to our planet for 30 million years and have been pollinating approximately 130 agricultural crops in the U.S., including fruit, fiber, nut, and vegetable crops. We rely on bees for most of our food, and they are a huge part of our world. One last little piece of trivia about honeybees is, is honeybee one word or two? The answer is, it could be either one word or two. Both are correct. So that concludes the fun facts that I have for you about ring-tailed lemurs and bees, and I hope you learned something that you didn't know before. If you want to learn even more about all kinds of other animals, I have a whole Fun Fact Friday playlist where I draw and talk about so many different types of animals. If you have any suggestions about animals you want to learn more about, don't be shy and comment below and maybe I'll do some art and talk about it in my next video. If you want to learn more about the animals that I talked about today, I always have the links that I use for the information I shared in every video in my description so you can do your own research and learn even more. I can't cover everything in the articles I find, so I encourage you to check them out. Also, do you know something cool about ringtail lemurs or bees that I didn't mention? Definitely let me know in the comments. I love constantly learning new things about animals that live on this planet. So now I have a bit of some ways to go to finish up this drawing. So by now I've added some watercolor pencil to add some more controlled washes of color variation. And then I move into colored pencil and really start to clean up and define the edges that I wasn't able to do with the watercolor. I really I really like to take my time in this step because I never want to overdo it and cover the watercolor textures completely. And after I was happy with the colored pencil, I moved into using my new favorite ink brush pen to further outline and add some really unifying marks to bring the whole thing together. I was really, really trying not to overdo it with the ink because sometime with this brush pen especially, I tend to go overboard with the line art and just end up outlining and having so much fun playing with the line weight. But for this illustration, I really tried to pull back and let the line art complement and not necessarily dominate with harsh outlines. So you will see that play out too. Also, any supplies that I use in any of my videos, I do have links in my description if you're curious or want to try them out for yourselves. So now let's hang out for a bit with some tunes and I'll meet you back here when it's done to wrap it up and give you some final thoughts.
So now I'm adding the final strokes of ink here and there and then I scan it in to do some final little tweaks to make everything come together digitally. I will probably refine it a little bit more digitally, but for now I am satisfied with this drawing and I had a lot of fun taking it slow and working through it. I just think it's so cool how one song can be inspiring enough to make me create something I definitely wouldn't have thought to create without hearing the song. Music is so powerful and I encourage everyone to take a moment and listen to a song that means something to you and get inspired to create. Anyway, if you made it this far and you like this video, don't forget to leave it a like and subscribe for even more art and animal related content. I do upload a new video here for you every Friday and I would love for you to become a creative creator with me and follow along on my YouTube journey. I'm really trying to hit 300 subscribers this year and I'm excited for the content that I have planned for this channel, so it mean a lot if you wanted to tag along and be here to watch my channel grow. Also, if you made it this far, leave me a comment for animal suggestions to talk about in a future video, or just say hi because I love chatting with you guys down there. You truly make my day. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay creative, and I will see you in next Friday's video.